The following is an encore presentation of a pre recorded program. To join one of our many live presentations, please visit cje.net slash events, call 773-508-1000, or follow us on your favorite social media platform. Welcome everyone. My name is Margaret Danilovich. I am the Senior Director of the Leonard Shanfield Research Institute here at CJE Senior Life. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our first lecture in our series this year on research perspectives on dementia. Um, so I'd like to just note that we're using the Zoom webinar format today. Um, so please use the Q&A or the chat to um, insert any questions you might have. We'll have time at the end um, for some, some Q&A and discussion. So feel free as the presentation is going to, to put those questions in the, the Q&A and chat box. Um, so it's my great pleasure to uh, turn the mic over to our uh, speaker, Dr. Emily Rogalski today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I am so glad to be here and to talk with you all. And um, I understand that, that the topic of this uh, the seminar series um, focuses on dementia, but today we're really going to talk more about um, the aging side of things. Um, and people who are called super agers. So my name is Emily Rogalski, and I'm a professor at Northwestern University uh, in the Department of uh, Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and um, the Mejulam, and the Associate Director of the Mejulam Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease. That's a mouthful, but means that we do aging and dementia research here at the center. Um, one of the programs I lead is on super aging, and that's what we're going to hear mostly about today. But as um, an introduction to uh, our center a bit, um, we are a, a multidisciplinary center who's, who's focused on the heterogeneity in aging and dementia. One of our, so let me unpack that a little bit. Um, one of our big pieces of infrastructure at our center is we're a nationally funded Alzheimer's disease center funded by um, the National Institute on Aging with, within the National Institute of Health. Um, there are 32 other, um, or there's more than 30 other Alzheimer's disease centers that are a part of this funding mechanism and, and we all work together. And that's what um, this map of the United States reflects up here. So the states that are in green are places that have nationally funded Alzheimer's disease centers. And the states that are in kind of that turquoise color are uh, newer sites that are just getting, uh, starting to launch their nationally funded program. Uh, one of the things that we do as an Alzheimer's disease center in that network is we invite people to participate in research. And those individuals can be um, healthy individuals, individuals who are worried about their memory, individuals who are having difficulty with memory or other thinking skills, um, and we ask them to come in and do some paper and pencil testing, maybe some imaging, and um, follow them over time. And each of the centers do this. And then collectively, um, we keep the, the information that we learn locally to, to do research, but also um, that information is shared and stored in a national database. So at our center, we've enrolled over 2,000 individuals into our longitudinal studies, um, but collectively across all the Alzheimer's disease centers, more than 40,000 individuals have been enrolled. And this is important because these data have helped to inform uh, what we've learned about aging and dementia and uh, the, the treatments that are now um, in clinical trials and coming down the pike. So at our center in, in general, we, um, uh, focus in different areas of, of thinking. So our, our, um, our focus is on heterogeneity and aging and dementia. And what does that mean? Um, so we look at multiple different uh, perspectives. So heterogeneity in um, cognitive profile or your memory and other thinking skills. Some individuals have real strengths in memory where others may have challenges with language or, or other um, are different thinking skills. We look at 
um, the neurobiology, how there's heterogeneity in the type of neurodegenerative disease that can affect older adults. Um, we know that our life experience as we get older is different depending on our family dynamics, our personal identity, um, and we are studying those factors as well. So at our center, we have, we like to say we cover everything from cells to social work. We have neuropsychologists, um, neurologists, clinical and cognitive neuroscientists like myself, neuropathologists and social workers all working together for this common goal of uh, better understanding aging and dementia trajectories, identifying um, uh, uh, care uh, and treatment plans for, for those and improving those options. And so listed on the right here are just some of the programs that we support. We are also supporting uh, trainees, the next generation of uh, individuals who are going to lead the way as clinicians or scientists. So we have specialized programs in neuropsychology, neuropathology, um, et cetera. Okay, so now I'm going to transition um, before we can talk about uh, super aging. I think it's important to kind of get all on the same page about the different types of terminology that are, are used. And so throughout this presentation, I'm going to have a few different audience questions and we haven't, uh, we haven't um, initiated a polling often, uh, option in this webinar, but you can just kind of answer this question as you're, as you're sitting um, in your home or wherever you're listening in and, and jot down your own answer. So the first question I have is, uh, what do you think? Is dementia a normal part of aging? Is this true or is this, is this false? Um, all right, let's think about this for a minute. And now let's kind of transition to, to talk through this. And it's really a, a more complex question than one, one might think or one that we uh, might have wished. So this next slide is gonna walk through a little bit of historical context. So in the 1900s um, is really when the first Alzheimer's case was described. And at that time, the belief was that senility um, which is the word that was used to de describe what happened as one got older um, and it had difficulties with, with thinking uh, abilities, that, that senility was really a normal and inevitable part of aging. And then um, when as time went by uh, in the 1970s, it was really when it was recognized that dementia is a disease and not a normal part of aging. So this, um, this idea got uh, kind of took hold that there was a disease related here. And then the definition for dementia is that it's a, a general term for the loss of memory or other thinking skills. And that it's that loss is so great that change in, in thinking abilities is so great that it significantly interferes with daily life, including work, school, or family. And then our current thinking is that we now understand that there's di many different dementia syndromes and each is associated with a distinct initial cognitive profile. So I've now kind of put this as a um, umbrella over here. So there's the umbrella term of clinical neurodegenerative dementia syndromes. And uh, there's Alzheimer's dementia, which um, many of us are familiar with uh, either through personal experience or at least by name alone. And that describes individuals where memory is the primary complaint of these individuals. And then the changes are, uh, there'll be other changes in cognition that get worse with time. But you may be less familiar with different, other different types of dementia syndromes, like the word primary progressive aphasia. And for these individuals, Language is the first symptom that appears and they have difficulty thinking of words in conversation and communicating. You can kind of think of this like that tip of the tongue phenomenon that we may all experience every once in a while when we can't remember the name of that person that we want to uh, talk to and um, or we can't remember that precise word we want to have. But imagine if that happened with each and every conversation and it got worse with time. That's part of um, what these individuals can experience. There are other dementia syndromes that affect uh, behavior and judgment 
or visual spatial uh, syndrome, uh, visual spatial skills. There are more dementia syndromes than the ones listed here, uh, but for the sake of brevity and for today's conversation, I just limited it to these four. Okay. Um, all right. So. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. So now we need to think about, well, what is aging and what is normal aging? And so first I thought I would kind of highlight, well, there's all of these things that are common in aging. So uh, it's common that as we get older, um, there's changes to our eyesight. Um, there's also changes to the exterior of our body. Our hair may get gray, our skin may get wrinkled, um, and, or our hair may fall out. Um, and just like there's these changes that are common uh, to our body, there are also changes that are happening inside of our brain. And so I thought I would highlight them here. So this is now an MRI scan of a 27-year-old who is cognitively healthy versus an 87 year old who is cognitively healthy. And it's as if we're making a cut right here um, down through our brain and then looking forward um, at the, the, the left and right sides of the brain. And what's highlighted here in these turquoise boxes uh, are uh, the hippocampi of the brain. And the hippocampi of the brain are really important structures for memory in our brain. They are, are what help to um, bind some of that information together and allow us to remember things over time and to learn new information. And what we see is that in an average 27 year old, uh, it's very filled in here, but if we look over at the cognitively healthy 87 year old, there's a lot of uh, black space and that black space is not, not great. Um, that means that there's been loss of brain matter or shrinkage of brain matter. And we know that these changes in brain matter are associated with changes uh, in cognition. So uh, this shows that uh, there's a decline in memory performance over time. And I'm going to make this figure just a little bit bigger here. And so what we have here is uh, age across the lifespan from our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. And then over here, our uh, memory test performance uh, where higher scores, higher numbers up here are better performance and lower scores are worse performance. And what we see is that these asterisks represent the average performance across the lifespan. And it's clear that there's this downward trajectory. So now I'm gonna bring us to our second question. Um, is cognitive decline uh, or cognitive decline is an inevitable consequence of aging. Is this true or is this false? Can you purely know someone's cognitive age by knowing their chronologic age? So if you know someone is 80 years old, can you automatically know what their cognitive age might be? From looking at that graph that I just showed you before, you might think that that could be true. However, if you take a closer look at that same information, but this time instead of those red asterisks, um, there's now dots and triangles on the graph. And these dots and triangles actually represent uh, real individual's performance. And I think this highlights, um, I always point this out to students, the importance of looking at individual data as well as average data, because it can tell you a, a more informed story of what's going on and really help you understand. And what we see is that when we're younger, um, this purple band also represents what we think of as being average um, for each uh, decade across the lifespan. And we see that that purple band is relatively narrow um, in our 30s and 40s and gets wider or more variable as we get older. And you'll notice that there's some people who kind of fall outside of this trajectory, either above or below. And so these individuals are, are doing worse than uh, the individuals who fall below are doing worse than expected for their age. Uh, but importantly, oops, sorry about that. Importantly, there are these individuals who are up here in the triangles who are doing better than expected. Um, and these are the individuals that got us excited about, uh, theoretically, the super aging project. So there are people who seem to be performing 
at least as well as individuals who are much younger than them. Okay. So now we can kind of change that statement or that question that we had up there earlier and say, cognitive decline may be common, but it's not an inevitable consequence of aging. Instead, one's cognitive age is more likely reflected uh, as a combination of genetic factors, experience, and the passage of time. And so from this, we can kind of summarize the, this first part of the uh, talk here by saying, okay, there's this simplified aging, there are these simplified aging trajectories. There's a pathologic aging trajectory where individuals experience accelerated cognitive decline or dementia. Um, and then there's this normal aging trajectory. And I put that in quote um, to, this is how, how we, um, because I don't know if normal is the right word, but um, where there's some degree of cognitive decline um, and um, some degree of decline in cognitive abilities, but these individuals are able to remain actively engaged in life and are not restricted. And what the idea that we had was, could we identify people who fit in the super aging trajectory and have little or no age-related uh, cognitive decline and remain highly functional in their later years? So we had to put some rules to this as scientists and the rules that we put in place where we were looking for individuals who are over age 80 because those individuals were at the greatest risk for decline. And then we wanted them to have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. So they're performing two to three decades at least um, uh, as good as individuals two to three decades younger than themselves. And then performance in other cognitive domains was it gonna be at least average for age. We're gonna invite these individuals to participate in research and follow them over time, and eventually ask them to donate their brain at the time of death, which um, is a really important aspect of our study because it tells us uh, we can only see with a, a certain resolution during life. So um, if you remember when we first got digital cameras, um, which is probably decades ago now, um, we, they were really exciting because we no longer needed film and you could see the image right away. But one challenge with those original digital cameras was when we went to print out those pictures, um, sometimes they were very pixelated because and, and blotchy and, and, and fuzzy because the resolution was not so great in those original digital cameras. That's kind of hard to believe now that we have fancy iPhones that take um, good pictures. But our resolution during life is sort of like that, where we can only see to a certain degree. And by uh, individuals making the ultimate sacrifice to share their brain at the time of death, it really allows us to look at cellular and molecular factors that wouldn't otherwise be uh, available for us to, uh, to know and understand. So, what does our super aging study do? Why, what are we interested in, in knowing? So we have what I call four biologic cores. We're interested in understanding um, our super agers. Uh, do they have outstanding performance in all aspects of cognition? Are they able to maintain this cognition over time? And do super agers have, um, what do their brains look like? Do they look more like younger individuals' brains? Um, what can we see under the microscope for those who donated their brain? And what genetic factors may play a role? We realize things are more complex than that. So we also look at, um, we're interested in understanding how these, uh, how does lifestyle factor play a role? Education, family history, and psychosocial factors. So we're taking a kind of multidisciplinary approach to understanding factors that are important for super aging. You may wonder, well, what is, why is super aging important and how does this fit in the, in the larger landscape of things? So we have gotten good as a medical community at extending our lifespan. People are living longer generally. And uh, that has, this has kind of come at as, as an imbalance though to our health span. So our lifespan isn't always matching up or in perfect balance with our health span. We think super agers represent a, a good example of how high, health span and lifespan are more on par or on balance with each other. And we wanna identify those factors so that uh, it, others can have this better, this balance of living long and living well. 
We think super aging offers an important opportunity for us to understand and in inform Alzheimer's research. And this was highlighted also at the uh, national and international level um, where they, they also, uh, it was a recommendation that to understand Alzheimer's disease, it's also to under, important to understand how people are avoiding um, Alzheimer's disease or change in uh, cognitive performance in their later years. Uh, SuperAgers, I think, do a great job of redefining expectations in a world that we are constantly bombarded by um, the bad news and the bad things associated with aging. Um, it's refreshing to keep um, sharing stories about how people are doing well and thriving as they age. And so here I'd like to highlight uh, one of our super agers who um, turned 107 this year. Um, and she, uh, when this interview was done in this picture, it was several years ago now, um, but she was interviewed by the Chicago Tribune. And during the interview, it might be hard to see in the image here, but she's actually beading. She's making a necklace with very small beads at age 102, I believe, was when the interview took place. Um, and I think she is a great example of redefining expectations. Um, here is a picture of her from last year when she celebrated her 106th birthday. And on, on the wall behind her are more than 200 cards that were mailed to her to wishing her a happy birthday. Superagers are also important for reducing stigma. Um, this is another picture of our superagers, uh, one of our superagers who likes to travel a lot. And in the background here are penguins on one of her many adventures. So there's a great deal of stigma associated with aging. And I think um, we need to do more to try to reduce the stigma and, and superagers can play a role in here. The next thing I want to highlight really is, is not my work, but really being kind of forward thinking of what's, what's the dream or what, how could this live out in different ways or why is this important to, to study superagers? And I, I want to highlight how in different cultures um, we are thinking about and celebrating aging differently. And uh, so there was this, this group in um, Zimbabwe where they, they recognized that one in four uh, individuals in Zimbabwe were uh, suffering from depression. And they had a real shortage, and there's a real shortage of psychiatrists, only 10 psychiatrists serving a population over, of over 13 million Zimbabweans. And also uh, more than 70% of Zimbabweans live below the poverty line. So getting access to medical care is also a challenge. Given all of these challenges, um, a group came in and decided, gosh, um, how could we change this landscape? And they took advantage of the fact that there were many grandmothers that were trusted individuals of the community and they gave them some training to uh, complete an evidence-based intervention um, called the Friendship Bench, where literally individuals um, uh, sit on benches in the community and help to bridge the mental health and treatment gap. They found um, that they were able to enhance uh, mental well-being and improve quality of life with problem-solving therapy delivered by these trained lay health workers and that they were as, as effective, if not more than, uh, effective than um, the, the psychiatrist alone and able to kind of fill part of this need or, or gap. So I like this example because it gives us an idea of how we could redefine our thoughts around aging and expectations. So I wanna circle back now to our super agers and share a little bit of the initial data that we have and observations and, and reports that we have found so far with the super aging study. And I should mention that uh, we are ongoing in our super aging research and um, just at the beginning to uncover um, many of the secrets that the super agers have to share with us. So this graph here just shows you memory performance of super agers is better than that of, um, or at least as good as 50 to 60 year olds, if not better, and much better than average 80 year olds. We've enrolled um, near um, more than 100 super agers now. This is a little bit out of date, and they're all over age 80 when they enroll, um, but at the 
Time of enrollment, they range in age from age 80 to 102, and then they stay with us over time. And uh, the majority of superagers are women. So I'll go ahead and preemptively answer um, a question about is there a bias or a difference um, in, in sex between whether you're likely to be uh, more likely to be a superager if you are a woman. We see that um, there, it's difficult to answer this question for a couple of reasons. There's, there's some inherent bias that we need to think about. One is that um, women tend to live a little bit longer, so that might be one contributing factor. And then the second, probably more important one, is that women tend to volunteer for research more often. So um, it's a little bit too early to talk about sex differences and the likelihood of one being a superager um, because of these biases, and we'll continue to, to better understand the factors that, that contribute there. And before I go on any further, I thought we would stop and I would let you um, meet a superager virtually um, through this video, which I think gives you a better sense of the type of people that um, we've been so uh, fortunate to, to meet and learn from. That's great that I'm a superager. Uh, uh, it isn't something that I trained for uh, or, or went to school for. Uh, it just happened. And, and I have no idea why, but I, I'm extremely grateful that at this age that I'm able to, to uh, care for myself. And although I live with my daughter and her family, uh, I could just as easily live independently at this stage of my life. And, and as I mentioned, I live with my daughter and her husband and their three children. And so that's, uh, I have to adapt to <laughs> to that kind of life. Uh, they don't know much about Frank Sinatra or uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So you have to, I have to keep saying is Chance the Rapper uh, coming this week or is it Taylor Swift? So I do have to ask those kind of questions to be relevant. <laughs> and, and I have, uh, said to myself, could it be my diet? And, and my daughter would say, you had the worst diet, uh, dad. I have no idea how people, you know, who eat um, uh, TV dinners every night for many years, uh, you shouldn't still be alive reading. And, and of course the TV and the internet. I think the internet is so remarkable because you can ask questions that, uh, years ago, we would never have been able to find the answers. So, so those things are all remarkable. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit of a sense of um, the, uh, the super agers that we're, we're connecting with and wanted to highlight a few things that come up as themes throughout. You'll see this idea of adaptation. Um, so that gentleman um, didn't have to live with his grandchildren, but uh, was finding ways to make connection with his with his uh, with his grandkids by um, relating to them in their musical styles and choices, and that that um, is is really special. And we see this idea of curiosity is one that that keeps uh, coming through in our in our super aging cohort. Okay, so I'm going to transition to a little bit of kind of the science of what we have been studying in superagers. And one of the, the questions you may ask is, well, gosh, what if the superagers just had a lucky memory day so that when if you follow them over time, they wouldn't really be able to maintain that great memory performance over time. And so we did a study several years ago now showing that over an 18 month period, the majority of the superagers were able to maintain that outstanding performance. So this gray region here is average performance for 50 to 60 year olds. These lines here, um, each one represents a superager. And this is their initial visit. And then in 18 months later at visit two, and we see that the majority of super age, and we've got, sorry, we've got memory performance here on, on the left, where again, higher numbers are better. And we see that the majority of the super agers are able to stay in this gray range and keep their good memory performance over time. 
And then just to, to kind of add on to that example, so some super ragers are in actively enrolling now um, and others, they have been with us for more than a decade. And this is an example of a super rager who was able to maintain that outstanding memory performance for more than seven and a half years. So uh, we, we do see that there can be some stability in this great memory performance, uh, suggesting that it's not just a lucky memory day um, for these individuals, that there's something unique um, about their ability to maintain this memory performance. The next question we looked at is, um, what do the brains of superagers look like? So we know we have individuals who are over age 80 chronologically. Um, do their brains look more like their 80 year old peers who they share chronologic age with, or do they look more like their 50 to 60 year old peers who they share a similar memory performance to? And this is work that's done in my lab um, with specialized uh, MRI imaging of the brain. So individuals, um, participated, participated in an MRI imaging session. And then uh, those data are shared to a fancy computer um, that does a lot of um, intense processing and allows us to have images of the brain. Right now we're looking down from above, but just at one side of the brain. And it's now been labeled um, on the out, outer edge in red, um, which we call the, the peel surface. And then also in yellow here, what we call the gray white junction. And what we're interested in is looking at the thickness between these red and yellow lines. And that tells us, um, that's called the cortex. That's the outer layer of the brain, kind of like a bark on a tree. And that's where our brain cells live. And by measuring the thickness of the cortex, we can get a proxy measure for the health of the brain. And we can do this at the individual level and then at the group level. And so here we've got another picture of a brain. Um, this is as if you're looking from the side now and your eyes would be up here and this is the back of your, um, the back of your head. And everywhere that you see red and yellow would be where one group showed thinning compared to another group. So that's this is your brain tutorial of neuroimaging for the day. So now I'm gonna move on to the results that we found. And we see that with our super agers, if we compare average 80 year olds to average 50 to 60 year olds, that there's a lot of red and yellow across the brain. Um, and that means that the brains of average 80 year olds are thinner um, they've had shrinkage relative to 50 to 60 year olds. This is not a new finding, um, but this is something that replicates work that had been out there before. Now, when we make that same um, analysis, but instead of average 80 year olds, we use super agers um, instead, I'm gonna now have our, our next audience question is, do you think the super ager brains are thinner uh, than, the 50 to 60 year olds thicker or about the same? So think about that for a minute. Do super agers brains, do you think they're thinner, thicker or about the same compared to 50 to 60 year olds? All right, let's take a look. Um, what we see is that there's no red and yellow, and this is not an error of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, this was actually what we found, is that there was no significant thinning across the cortex of the brain. And then if we play this little movie, it's going to kind of twirl the brain around here. And now we're looking um, deep in the brain as if we pulled the two hemispheres apart and we're peering in, and we see there's a region in blue. And we haven't yet talked about blue. Uh, it wasn't part of our tutorial, but blue actually means that super agers had a thicker uh, cortex than average 50 to 60 year olds. So that part of their brain was thicker in the super agers than the 50 to 60 year olds. So normally at this point, people say, oh gosh, what is that region? What's it for? And how do I get one? Is it good if I have a thicker one? Um, and I can't answer all of those questions, but I can tell you that this region of the brain is called the anterior cingulate. Um, and we know that it's important for attention and attention is really important for memory, um, to support memory. And so this may be one of the secrets that the superagers are, are teaching us about how they're able to maintain this great memory performance. 
Because of this finding, uh, we then focused some of our our microscope work in this area to try to understand what, why is it thicker? What's helping to um, uh, create that composition of a, of a thicker brain, or a thicker brain region there. Okay, so the next study we asked was, okay, well, how did superagers end up with uh, a thicker cortex or how did they avoid that? Um, how are they able to maintain a brain that looked like 50 to 60 year olds? Is it because we know that with normal aging, there's some, some shrinkage with time. Did superagers start with, with bigger brains um, or are they resistant to age-related atrophy? Um, are they avoiding that shrinkage over time? And to uh, answer this question fully, it would have been nice to have MRI scans across the lifespan of superagers. Unfortunately, we don't have that information. Um, but we, what we do have is superagers come back over time. And so we can look prospectively at, is there, what's the rate of thinning moving forward? And so we compared uh, superager uh, rate of thinning to that of average 80 year olds. And we found that the average 80 year old brain, uh, 80, 80 year old the average 80 year old participants brains were shrinking at a rate more than two times that of the superagers. So there really seems to be something different about the trajectory um, on, of their, the brain health or brain integrity of the superagers. We're now using even more um, advanced techniques to look at brain shape and how um, it may play a role. And so we can look at the folds of um, how the, the brain is working and we can generate something um, called a brain age. So if this is an, an average uh, 64 year old, um, you would see a more shrinkage with an average 84 year old. And then the superager would then look more like this average 64 year old where there's less space between what we call, um, these are called gyri and sulci. Um, and this is just highlighted a little bit more here with the red and green coloring now on top of this. So we did uh, a small study to look at, okay, what uh, could we create a, a brain age um, based using an algorithm um, that looks at the shape and thickness of the brain? And we do this by saying, okay, here's your chronologic age, and then um, here's your, your predicted age based on um, the shapes and folds of, of your astral brain. And what we see is that the superagers, indeed, the majority of them have a brain age gap of negative 20 years. That means that the superager brains look like their uh, 50 to 60 year old brains on average. Um, all except for this one super up here who is hovering around zero. And so that means that their brain age better matched their chronologic age. Okay, so the next thing we have been doing is looking under the microscope at uh, the histopathology, which is just a, a fancy word for looking at um, cellular and molecular factors. So um, here again, I'm gonna show um, a brief video clip um, of the importance of, of um, brain donation from the words of one of our superagers. Now to our ongoing series of brain power today. This morning, Maria Shriver takes a look at an extraordinary group of people making a difference in brain research. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Hoda. Well, every 65 seconds in America, someone new develops Alzheimer's. But in Chicago, there's a rare group of seniors who not only avoid the diseases of old age, they maintain the brain power of someone more than half their age. Now each of them is giving a gift that could someday unlock the mysteries of growing old. I'm gonna make a butterscotch marshmallow cookie. When 104-year-old Edith Rentro Smith makes cookies, nothing's written down. So where's your recipe? Here. Mixed in are vivid stories of an amazing life. The first time she heard a radio. It was a very exciting time. Or that time she met Amelia Earhart. You felt like you really knew her. How could she disappear? Born in 1914, the same year World War I broke out, Edith lived through 18 U.S. presidents and is still sharp as a tack. You've never struggled with your memory? Oh, no. Oh no. How do you feel? 
I had 104. I feel good. Edith is a member of an elite group of seniors called super agers. These are individuals who are over age 80 and have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. Question is, how did they do this? It's a mystery. Emily Rogowski and researchers at Chicago's Northwestern University are trying to solve by gathering the largest group of super agers in the world. But to be invited in, you can't just be old. You must pass a test with 15 words. And they have to remember at least nine of them. Out of the 15. Out of the 15. To make it even harder, we even give them a distractor list in between. And then we ask them about that first list again. And some of them can remember all 15. So that's even more impressive. But it's what the super agers agree to do in the end that's really helping researchers. Each will donate his or her brain. This is one of the really important parts of the study is that people actually have given that ultimate gift of donating their brain at the time of death. Inside those brains, no, there's something else Edith and other superagers all have in common, and you don't need a microscope to see it. A positive attitude. So no complaining, no worrying. No, you can't complain. She still reads four books a week, and the most stress you'll see from her when she forgets those cookies are in the oven. You have to agree to donate your brain. At the oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They can't stop your brain unless they get it. So unless they have my brain, they can't put all, put all those little squiggle squiggles they got in. <laughs> I think we're going to learn a lot from your brain. I hope so. I hope so. And if it helps somebody... Think how much that it means to that individual if they get help. What's exciting about this, I think mm -hmm. all the people in this are really excited because they feel they're doing a public service of sorts. They're donating their brains and they have this positive attitude about growing old, about their uh, ability to give this gift to the rest of us so we can learn about how to grow old and be a super ager, which is what we all want to be. It's like unlocking your secrets and right. they'll be right there. I think that's what's exciting in all of these studies is people want to know what are the secrets yeah. and we can only learn if people actually participate in these kinds of trials. All right, Maria, thank you so much. <laughs> So um, I, I'm just always struck by the, the altruism and um, generosity of all of our participants and, and just couldn't be um, more thankful for all the time that, that everyone gives us. And so I want to talk now and transition to thinking about what do we see when we look under the microscope? And one thing that we focused on originally was back to that um, anterior cingulate finding of it being thicker, if you remember from a little bit ago in the talk. And we looked at something called von Economo neurons. These are specialized brain cells that are really large brain cells um, compared to other uh, cells in the um, brain, different types of brain cells. And they have some other unique features in that they've only been described in the anterior cingulate and frontal insular regions of the brain and only been described in higher order species. We see that the loss or abnormal development of von Economo neurons uh, has been present in autism and schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder and frontotemporal dementia and in Alzheimer's disease. So we think that these von Economo neurons may have something to do with social behaviors. And um, we were interested in understanding whether superagers, uh, the density of their von Economo neurons was, was greater or less than what we would see in average aging. So our, I think this is our last audience question of the day is compared to average 80 plus year olds, do you think there's more von Economo neurons, less von Economo neurons, or about the same number of von Economo neurons? And we're a little short on time, so I'm just gonna kind of plop ahead here. And what we see is that superagers have more von Economo neurons, um, a greater density of von Economo neurons compared to average elderly controls. And um, really more than four times that. And we followed this up with another study that showed that superagers actually have a greater density than even individuals who are very young. So individuals who are as young as in their 20s. So this is another special feature of superagers and we're now digging deeper to understand the genetics behind this and um, the importance of these neurons. So more to come. 
um, genetic factors. We're still at the very beginning of looking at genetic factors related to superagers. Um, genetic studies generally need really large numbers of participants. And um, we're just now kind of building up to those appropriate numbers to ask a lot of those questions. One of the ones that we have looked at though is saying, well, there's something called a polygenic hazard score that has been developed for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, this is a, a score that gives um, a, a risk for Alzheimer's disease and that has been developed for research use only so far. And we wanted to say, well, do superagers just represent people who have high um, genetic, or sorry, excuse me, do superagers have low genetic risk for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease? Or is there something special about their Alzheimer's disease risk? And what we see is that superagers um, and healthy controls both have relatively low risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease because the average centers around zero, but the groups do not differ from each other. So uh, they, they don't just represent an, a group of individuals who have abnormally low um, risk for Alzheimer's disease. They have about the same low risk as uh, uh, this group of, of healthy average can, um, 80 plus year olds. So we would, then conclude that the determinants of superior memory performance in older age cannot solely be explained by having unusually low risk for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and then the next thing we look at was uh, psychosocial factors. And there's a lot of work going on here, but I wanted to highlight one of our publications um, that looked at uh, super agers performance on a um, self-report measure of psychological well-being. And what we see is that there's six different parts to this scale, looking at positive relations with others, purpose in life, self-acceptance, autonomy, environmental mastery, and personal growth. And we see that the superagers compared to their average 80-year-old peers reported um, stronger um, positive relationships with others. So satisfying one example of a question from the scale is satisfying warm, trusting, high quality relationships with others. So there's something potentially different about how they're approaching um, their relationships with others. And that's another space now that we can dig deeper to better uncover um, this, their, their approach in this space. So as we kind of come towards the end of our time together today, um, I thought I would go over five questions that people often ask me about superagers. Do they exercise often? So we have um, about more than 80% of them report that they currently exercise. Uh, I, don't, I can't go into greater detail than that. Um, this is self-report. Some people may be biking uh, many, many miles like this superager below. Uh, this particular superager is doing a, a, a stretching class um, in exercising in their chair. Um, do they smoke or drink? Um, more than 70% report uh, past tobacco use. Um, I do not think that this means that we should run out and grab a, a pack of cigarettes. I think this is likely um, partially reflective of the era in which superagers grew up and the prevalence of smoking um, decades ago. Um, more than 80% report that they currently um, have a glass of wine or, or a drink. Um, when do they retire? Many of the superagers are still working. And um, if they're not, excuse me, oops, one last thing. Um, many of them are, are, are still working. If they're not working, they're really actively engaged in volunteer work or um, other activities. So this comes to the question, like what are the best ways to keep your brain active? And I wanna highlight again, um, a study from one of my colleagues who I think did a, a really lovely study where they asked individuals um, to come in um, and they were randomized to one of three groups, a group that learned how to knit, um, and these were none of these individuals were knitters before, a group that took a photography class, and then a group um, that watched TV or didn't do any of those activities. And what they found was that, well, what's the brain benefit of photography versus knitting um, versus watching TV? And what they saw was that both the photography group and the knitting group 
um, showed similar brain benefits. And so the takeaway from this is uh, the brain likes to do new things and learn new things. And so uh, it's not that there was something particularly magical about knitting itself or um, photography itself, but it was finding something that people that you enjoy personally and um, that is challenging to you. Okay, then do super agers eat a lot of blueberries? This one I kind of put up there jokingly to just remind us of the, the many, many um, marketing ads out there saying, if you just eat this or if you just do that. And I, I don't think that there's any one magical um, remedy for just having 10 blueberries is, gonna, is going to be the right solution. Um, but we do see that super agers um, very widely in their diet, in their diets, just as the gentleman you saw on the um, in the video a little bit earlier today. And then finally, um, a little bit of a, a selfless plug. Um, I think I know a superager. How can he or she enroll in our study? And I will put up a uh, this website again at the end in this email. But if you're interested in participating in our research, we would we would love to have you. And if you're not yet over age 80, we'd still like to talk to you because we have other research studies um, at our center um, that may be a good fit for you. And so in summary, I've talked to you a little bit today about superagers and showed you um, information about how they are uh, a rare phenotype with unique biologic, genetic, and psychosocial features. Um, they have superior, they're able to maintain superior memory over time. They have thicker brains and less cortical uh, shrinkage with time. They have an abundance of von Economo neurons. They have low, but not unusually low um, risk for Alzheimer's disease. The majority of them are still um, exercising or leading active lifestyles. They range um, in education from high school to advanced degrees. There are some with longevity in their family histories and other with, um, with a history of dementia, and um, they seem to have strong social relationships. As we move forward in the super aging study, I'm excited to report, we just learned that uh, we're expecting a new um, grant from the National Institute on Aging, which is gonna allow us to expand our super aging study um, to five sites across the US and Canada. And our partners um, for this expansion are listed here, the University of Mich Michigan, um, Emory in Atlanta, um, uh, Wisconsin, and then um, a, a group in Canada um, in partnership with um, Western uh, University in, in Ontario. As we expand not only in sites, we are also expanding in scope of the type of science that we're able to cover and look at. And so these um, areas that we are planning to expand to are listed here. And then last but not least, I want to thank everybody for their time today and a special thanks to our super aging participants for their commitment to, to our research, because truly without them, none of this work would be possible. This picture is now a little outdated, um, but the super agers, uh, we we uh, in non-pandemic times, uh, try to get together from um, from time to time for a, a cocktail hour and some some music. And this is a picture from our uh, last super aging party a few years ago. So I'll stop there and we can kind of transition to questions at this point. Thank you so much. That was incredibly informative. Um, feel free to chat in your questions right now, but I'll, I'll start. Um, you talked about sort of this, this concept of attention and memory. And the, the question and comment came up that it seems like nowadays we are just inundated with information and technology and our phones are beeping and it's information overload and everything's coming at us to get our attention. So how do you think that sort of impacts memory and what should we be doing about that? Sure, yeah, it's certainly overwhelming. And as a, as a mom of two young kids, I also wanna kind of take those devices away sometimes and, and really monitor. Um, so I think it is, it's important to um, think about where is technology helpful in your life and really where is it kind of intruding and becoming a distraction? 
Is it distract? Is it um, affecting sleep? Are you using those devices close to bed and now you're having trouble sleep and it, sleeping and it's and it's disrupting your sleep routine? We know that um, sleep is so very important for our cognitive health, and so having a good sleep routine and and um, being mindful of how and when we're using technology, I think, is certainly more important um, now because of its prevalence. So. It, it does take some work, I think, to um, kind of zero in and, and say, I'm going to turn these devices off and coming up with a routine that works for you. Great. Um, you also spoke about sort of psychosocial factors that influence aging and, and being a super ager. Um, you know, here at CJE, we have um, about 1800 Holocaust survivors in our network. Um, and the question kind of came up about a history of trauma, either emotional trauma, physical trauma. Um, and, and if you have any data or what the research would say about sort of, of the effect of trauma and that history on our cognitive aging? Sure. So um, yeah, trauma, this, this actually, I'm glad that you brought this up because it's something I forgot to mention that I, I normally do mention is um, when we think about psychological well-being and like who these super agers are, some people might assume that, well, gosh, these are probably people who just like they had easy lives and like maybe everything was was good for them from their you know financial standpoint or just what they encountered and we actually don't find that that's true um, I, I don't say this for people to go out and find <laughs> traumatic events but we we actually have um, participants in our study who or who were Holocaust survivors in fact um, and we have others who lost their children at a young age um, people who encountered poverty um, at a young age and throughout their life um, so one feature that we do see with superagers is resilience is a word that comes to mind and, and is a good characterization of how they've been able to bounce back um, against different types of adversity and better understanding how do you build that resilience and capacity and what does that do to protect your brain um, is I think really important. Um, so it's not only the, we certainly know trauma is not healthy for the brain, um, but uh, are there ways to bounce back and mitigate? Um, and and uh, these are features that we're really um, interested in. And in fact, we had the super agers, um, a subset of them, we've started another uh, side research project where they've completed life stories and we're learning how, um, how do you tell your story of your life? Um, if we say, tell me a high point and a low point in your life, when you describe that challenge, do you talk about it as, gosh, this bad thing happened to me and it led to another bad thing and another bad thing. Or you say, man, this terrible thing happened. But then from it, um, I learned this or I was able to overcome. And so understanding people's approach to life um, and this opens new opportunities for interventions as well, thinking about um, building resilience and capacity in that regard. Great. Um, going back to sort of the idea of dementia as um, the umbrella term and specific forms kind of falling under that, where do you see differences or, or how are the manifestations of, of uh, cognitive performance different by those groups? Um, and are you seeing differences in cognitive domains in the super agers compared to sort of the 80 year old control group? Sure, sure. So um, again, we kind of think of dementia as that umbrella term, and then there's different types of dementia. Um, so there are um, reversible forms of dementia, and then there's the neurodegenerative um, aspect, which is what um, that umbrella was focusing on today. And for, for those individuals with Alzheimer's dementia, those profiles of um, versus primary progressive aphasia, the areas of deficit um, or challenge will look really different at the beginning of the disease, but with time, um, um, there may be additional changes. So for an individual with Alzheimer's dementia, memory loss is that primary feature. For an individual with PPA, language loss is that primary feature. Um, but as the disease unfortunately doesn't stay still. Um, and as it moves to different parts of your brain where different cognitive uh, functions live, then um, additional deficits will accrue. Um, the superagers we see have 
strength in memory performance, but they also seem to also have uh, strengths in attention and executive function when we, when we look at them. Well, we're just at, out of time, so I apologize. We couldn't get to every uh, question uh, today, but I threw in the information. If you were interested in participating in research opportunities, it's in the chat box. Um, I want to acknowledge that today's lecture has been generously supported um, through a grant from the Jewish United Fund. Um, this lecture will also be posted on the CJE YouTube site for viewing and sharing with friends and family, so we hope that you can get this information out to others um, in the community. Our next lecture in this series um, will be on October 13th, so you can save the date. Um, our speaker will be Dr. Angela Roberts uh, from Northwestern, who will be presenting information and research on the link between language uh, communication and cognition. Um, so with that, I really want to send uh, my uh, deep gratitude here to Dr. Rodalski for, for presenting such a wonderful lecture today. Um, thank you to all of uh, you for attending and please do join us again October 13th.